See, while the, while the Northern Hemisphere is enjoying its summer and Europe and North America, you guys deserve a good summer because winter there is awful. But that means down here in Australia, yeah, things are still pretty chilly. So I've got my tea here and it's time to talk about distro hopping. So here's where I'm coming from. Um, this Today's video is gonna be a bit of a, a kind of a Q&A situation, or at least responding to some of the most common questions that I get on my channel and, uh, and Twitter and, and the like. And, uh, and just kind of explain, you know, where I'm at at the moment. And as specifically in regards to distro hopping, because I think if you've ever run Linux for any period of time, you're well aware of the condition that is known as distro hopping. Distro hopping is where you try to get the best out of every single distribution, but you end up ultimately finding yourself installing and reinstalling and reconfiguring systems more often than just actually sitting there and living with the system for, you know, a good period of time. And um, I wouldn't say I'm in that distro hopping stage, but I can feel myself right on the verge. I'm, I'm about to slip into it. So let me give you a bit of background as to what uh, the last couple of, a couple of months, or really since the beginning of this year has looked like for me. Right, so I started off the year with Solus, the Solus, um, Solus project. Solus is a fantastic, built from scratch, rolling release. Um, it's very well developed, it's very well up to date, it's very focused. I still love the Solus project, I think it's amazing. But there were some limitations regarding software and, and uh, software support and hardware compatibility um, with the hardware that I was running at the time. Specifically, a lot of the tools and tweaks that you would use to run Solus on a MacBook um, were not as good as what you could get on other distributions. Um, so all of those details are in a vlog series that I did of Adventures in Solus and I'll chuck a link up in the cards. You guys can check that out if you want. Now, moving on from there, um, we jumped back into uh, basically the Ubuntu land for a while. And, uh, and that's kind of where I've been um, in different versions for the last few months. Uh, and obviously with Ubuntu 18.04 coming up, I spent a, quite a bit of time with each of those releases that I reviewed. Um, but the, the things that I love about Ubuntu uh, are obviously, you know, the, the hardware support is great, the software support is great because it has such a vast user base. But also at the same time, I don't feel like Ubuntu is the most focused or, or well-engineered system, if that makes sense. There's a lot of inefficiencies that really bug me. And, uh, and so it leaves me wanting, uh, it leaves me wanting more, basically. Um, so here's my problem. I am currently, uh, like back here, we've got elementary Loki running at the moment just because I felt like using something that was really put design at the forefront. And I love the elementary project for that reason. And also I love what they're doing in terms of creating a, a sort of an indie app store in that uh, making it very easy and straightforward for developers to make uh, well, well curated, uh, well designed, well engineered, very simple apps for their users and have quick monetization uh, or, or at least a seamless monetization process there that people can pay what they want and whatever they value that software to be. Is it getting too bright in here? Because the light's kind of coming and going a bit, so you'll just have to excuse me for that. Okay, so um, elementary is great, but again, it still un has a lot of the underlying problems of the Ubuntu release cycle in that now a lot of the software that I'm interested to check out and, and the, the stuff that I want to be able to use is, is you have to add PPAs and, and updating and, and it just gets so clunky and you end up installing so much extra stuff that you honestly don't need just to be able to run the latest software with some uh, projects. On the flip side, these uh, releases, and I'm thinking specifically of Elementary and, and KDE Neon, because they're based only on the long-term support release of Ubuntu, I find that uh, that means you do get a lot of stability in that I don't get many crashes or, or bugs or anything like that in these systems. And for a production machine that's doing video editing and graphic design and, and that kind of thing, content creation in general, I really appreciate stability. So uh, I don't know, Those are my th that's kind of where my head's at at the moment. Now, here's the thing. Coming up next week, I'm going to be doing uh, a review of OpenSUSE 15. Um, OpenSUSE and I go back a long, long way. Uh, my one of the first distros that I actually tried. The first one to actually live on my computer was Linux Mint 8, I believe. Yeah, Linux Mint 8. 
But the first one that I actually tried and, um, and, and you know, tried to learn how to use was OpenSUSE 11.2, I believe. And, uh, and it's because it came on a double-sided DVD on the front of a Linux magazine, so, woo! Um, but the thing is, um, like, I love the technical engineering and the, the efficiency of a project like OpenSUSE, and it seems to me that they've become more and more focused over the last, uh, over the last couple of years. And I love the fact that now they're, they're correlating their release cycle or they're correlating their release numbers so that there's transferability between the community version, OpenSUSE, and their commercial offering, uh, SUSE Enterprise Linux. And, um, and for that, I, I really commend the OpenSUSE project and I'm really looking forward to digging into OpenSUSE for the purposes of the, the upcoming review. So stay tuned for that. But, um, but I'm still in this space where I don't really know what I'm wanting to run on my production um, on my production machine. So here's the thing. I'm wanting to poll you guys and um, I'll put something on Twitter and you guys can jump in the comments about what do you, what's a, what's a good distribution here? And I, I feel like I've looked at the major ones, but here's what I need. I need the system, the core system to be stable. Uh, but I also kind of want to have the almost latest or at least the latest long-term stable desktop environment the desktop environment question then comes in so huh, preferably I'd like something GTK based but I feel like it's becoming less and less of a of a possibility in terms of finding something that works well across the board so stable system preferably GTK based but I think I might have to budge there and just get used to KDE because KDE is just getting so doggone good these days. Um, and the latest or at least latest stable uh, apps and a, and a vibrant app ecosystem, vibrant developer ecosystem. I don't know. I feel like I've already done the homework and I might already know where I need to land with this, but I'm always curious to hear your opinion. So that kind of answers the question, what system do you run? What's the cycle? Usually I will live within, within a distribution and have that as the main one that I'm working on for a good month, month and a half, maybe two months. And then if I feel like I'm doing too much of the same thing, whether it's updating or adding PPAs or whatever, then I'll start going looking elsewhere. Is it an addiction? Probably. And it's right on the verge. So maybe you guys can save me, maybe not. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this just came from, um, from a tweet that I did yesterday, was regarding uh, upgrading phones. I feel like in 2018, we don't need to be buying flagship phones. And I'll keep this one brief because we're already running in, running past time here. But the fact that people are still buying fifteen hundred dollar okay in Australia, just let's clear that up. So about a thousand US dollars. The fact that people are buying phones that are worth a thousand US dollars, honestly, you can get ninety percent of the phone that costs a thousand US dollars or fifteen hundred Australian dollars. You can get ninety percent of that for literally a quarter or maybe a third of that price. So case in point um, for me at the moment, I was um, back in the beginning of 2017, um, I got myself a, a very good deal on an iPhone SE. Now the iPhone SE is basically the iPhone 6S that came out in 2015 and it's the internals of that crammed into an iPhone 5S body. Uh, so basically, great performance in a very small package and, and it served me very well. I enjoyed the phone uh, immensely. But here's the thing, I'm getting a couple of things in the mail very soon. Um, I'm getting a, an Android um, smart watch, uh, the TicWatch E, I think. And, uh, and I'm also getting uh, wireless um, earbuds. Uh, so the thing is they play a lot nicer with Android just in general and also I've been sort of getting sick of the whole iOS lock-in um, So considering now the machines that I have I've got a surface book with a performance base. I've got my main XPS laptop back here um, And I don't know I was just kind of getting a bit sick of the whole Mac lockout thing uh, or Apple ecosystem So anyway, I ended up picking up a Nokia uh, 6.1 the 2018 edition in the in the lovely coffee color uh, with the kind of copper around the edges and I picked this up for 327 Australian dollars that translates to I don't know roughly 230 240 US dollars maybe 
The point of the matter is that I am so impressed with what you can get for a mid-range or even below mid-range phone these days and the processor that's in this thing, the Snapdragon 630, still benches higher than what a flagship chip was in 2015, the A9 from Apple. Now I realize, you know, Geekbench is, is only one benchmark and real world use does vary depending on what you're doing and each processor has its strengths. But I don't know, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, what is your next phone purchase going to be? And do we still need to be paying seven, 800, 900, a thousand US dollars to get a good phone? Because honestly, from where I'm sitting, the mid-range game is getting so strong now that even even the, the previous budget champions, like the OnePlus line, which you can't get in Australia, so boo-hoo, but the, the, the OnePlus line, even they are getting more expensive do we need that much power in a phone? I don't know, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know this has been a uh, an all over the place kind of video today, um, but I feel like this is a useful conversation. And, uh, and also I need one other input from you guys. I want to know what is the best, the best GNOME distribution out there uh, in terms of experiencing vanilla GNOME the way that the GNOME Foundation envisions it because I'm going to be working on a follow-up video to the why power users hate GNOME. So let me know in the comments what do you think about the whole mid-range phone situation and also a decent GNOME desktop. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, stay warm. That's useless. You guys are all warm. It's summertime up there. Uh, but if you're watching in the Southern Hemisphere, stay warm uh, and I will catch you all in the very next video. Peace out, ladies and gentlemen.